Thank you very much, Jasmine and Damien, uh, for joining me on uh, Film My Run. I, I'm sure that everybody watching is well aware of, of what you guys have done. But we're going to concentrate on the Barclays. Jasmine, when, when did you first kind of hear about the Barclays? How long ago did it enter your consciousness? I'm not, I'm not even sure when I first heard about it, like a long time ago. But I can say when I kind of first became aware of it as like properly aware of it was after the spine when a number of people said to me um that, that you know that Laz had said in an interview that he was keen to see me try Barkley and at that point I wasn't super convinced by the idea of re running laps in a forest but it sort of grew on me it was one of those things it was like the spine that grew on me in the same way because you have to go to that race like 100% wanting to do it you have to be all in I think if you want to finish so many times you do an interview, whether it's a podcast or, or or sort of a live thing, and nearly always at the end, someone says, what about the Barclay? When are you going to do the Barclay? <laughs> and after several years of that, you're like, well, I'm flipping better. Give it a go, I suppose. You, you talk, you still talk, Damien, like you're a new runner. That may be true, but honestly, I'm, I'm just as in love with this 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 sport, this these adventures as I was when I first started, you know, did my first ultra marathon um 2012 pretty sure it was and and just this whole world opens up to you doesn't it of, of you know the, there's so many different events it doesn't even have to be an event and and I just love it I just love it and I, you know I've come back you know in some ways I've failed but I've had an amazing adventure I've always been kind of excited by the idea of being told that I that something's impossible especially if somebody says it's impossible for a woman then that's the, immediately the mm -hmm. thing that would kind of make me say well like you know watch me um kind of um watch me try and um, so I was prepared to go there the first time and sit and you know find out maybe it is impossible but I needed to see for myself first and actually what happened is I went there and I was like I think this is possible. The legendary nature of Barclay people who haven't been there and, and I'm one of them we tend to think of you know the way they talk about the steep inclines and the briars you imagine that it's like nothing you've ever experienced before Probably the rounds are the most similar because you take the more direct route straight up something steep. So on the Paddy Buckley going up something like Knicked, uh, that's probably the most similar uh, for that. That you know there'll only be a very few people nodding perhaps at that, but um, um, it's very steep. And Jasmine actually, I don't know if she remembers, but when I first asked her what it was like, she said you're either you're either hiking steeply up or sliding down. Um, and and but I mean it, some of that's great fun. I mean the the downs can be good fun. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty to them. They're sort of clinging to trees and not sure whether the branches will snap off and underfoot. Often it's relatively safe, but there are always moments where suddenly it isn't. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's not it's not just pure hell out there. There is, and it, and it can be can be beautiful. Um, but yeah, I, I guess a fell running round would be the most similar that we've got. This year, I guess it was interesting how many people were together this year. Damien will probably agree. There was a lot of people together at the start of this year. Um, we started a kind of a pretty good time. So we kind of had, I guess, darkness for the fir very first bit. But then it was, you know, into sunshine and daylight. And um, yeah, and um, there was a kind of a few new book locations that kind of brought people back together a bit. So there was... You know, it felt it felt kind of quite sociable and I would say for the first two thirds of the first loop this year and um, there's this new section of the course that was very brambly and um, so that wasn't you know that was definitely not a trail run um, in that sense <laughs> I, think, I think we all, all cursed a bit as we went through it five times in some cases what yeah. did you do in training leading up to this year uh, I guess I think me and Damien pro probably both we did quite a lot of vert um I did um yeah I, I guess I was kind of for longer runs I was tending to when I was trying to maximize the vert vertical ascent I was kind of finding a hill that had was fairly steep um that I could get kind of the most climb I could get in in a shorter distance and then just running up and down I did definitely did multiple sessions um of certainly long runs where I would do just go up and down the same hill multiple times like one one night where I actually ran overnight 17 times up and down the local hill in a kind of blizzard stroke sleet storm and then quite a lot of strength work I definitely did more I know Damon's been doing that for a while but I definitely did more weighted strength work I did a lot more with weights this time than I've done before. Do you have to have a good year to get this finished in terms of do you have to have the start time at the right time do you have to have decent weather to make this a doable race? 
I'm not sure that the start time is that important, but I do think the weather is important. Um, certainly in the sense that I think if you had bad weather, then it, it would very quickly become impossible, almost impossible to finish. In some ways, I was lucky that I couldn't keep up in the first two years that well <laughs> with the lead group because basically it forced me to make all the mistakes. You know, just as an example, last year in the fourth loop, I made a probably a similar to mistake to the one that Damien made this year, maybe a little bit less dramatic. The first year, as I say, on loop three, I think it must have taken me like 16 hours or something. And I made like every mistake in the book almost. But I I learned from those. And the remarkable thing was that this year, um, I mean, this year I went into it thinking, I, I've learned... I've learned my way around this course. What I need to be able to do is be a bit faster in the first few loops so that I can kind of cash in on knowing what I'm doing navigationally in the later ones because when I can go a bit more slowly, the more you look at the compass going downhill, the more likely you are to land on your bottom and that that happened to be a lot on loop five. For both of you, looking looking at Keith Dunn's tech tweets, the first four loops were like a breeze for all of you. It was a, It was a walk in the park. It was like a 10K. Not, not me. <laughs> on the seafront. That's, that's not the way I was feeling at the end of the before, <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, Damien, tell me what, what, what happened on Loop 5. Well, it is interesting because Jasmine and I have almost learned the Barclay from the opposite, the opposite directions. In, um, and certainly the advice from reading, reading blogs before my first go was, you know, if you're a virgin, you've got, you've got to go with a veteran and learn all you can. And this year I was more conscious to try and, to be trying to learn um certainly john john encouraged it as well i did that i did the sort of i think it must have been loop three or four jasmine i don't think you're with us it anymore was, but i did the sort of you were on loop three um did i do most I, of stallion I, I when, there you were there. when he was offering opportunities to now okay yeah i so did i think i did most of the stallion section which is the section that's always baffled me the most so i was gaining some confidence but yeah ultimately i i need to be better on my own um whether that's yeah, I mean, I've, I've I've got an obvious area to work on, which which is which is kind of exciting. Like, if it was baffling how I couldn't do it, it would be more more frustrating. Yeah, John was, you know, he did. He's been open that he made, you know, he was in charge of of the nav quite, you know, quite a lot of the time, or at least he was backing up people, and he made quite a few mistakes. But he's very quick at spotting them and very quick at correcting them. And the thing was, don't let a small mistake become a big mistake. So, mm -hmm. like, small mistakes are they're inevitable, really, especially as you get tired and it's dark. But uh, yeah, that's what happened to me. A small mistake became a became a big mistake and I still found the book but I just took too long when when somebody who doesn't know about the Barclay uh, looks at how long it takes you to do 20-ish <laughs> miles what is it that takes the time is it the climbing or is it the finding the books when you're actually in the right place which sounds obvious finding the books is not is not you know a difficult thing I would say once you once you find the right spot like roughly within I know, 20 metres, you'll recognise the surroundings and you then you find the book. If you're not made, making those catastrophic navigational errors, then what's taking the time is the combination of the climbing. And then in places, just difficult terrain. So everybody talks about brambles at Berkeley. Um, and I'd say, for most part, they're not massive. They're not slowing you down a huge amount. Um, but there was one section this year when they were, I'd say, they did slow us down. Talk to me a little bit about what Laz writes down as instructions and 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 is is that in any way useful to you yeah no they are useful they are useful fundamentally but he has it you know he has his own um personality to them and, and his one of his favorite things to write is sort of you come to a high wall which which what they mean is a natural cliff you come to a high wall one way is much easier one way around it is much easier than the other full stop and then he doesn't he doesn't say which way it's up to you to <laughs> Yeah, he used to encourage you to sit down and admire the view, and so it, there's full of it's full of humour, but it is yeah, it is mostly helpful. Some of it's so kind of detailed for a short section has so many things that there's no way that you can remember it possibly, and you've not got time to read it when you're out there. I mean, you're like holding both poles and breathing hard, and there's no way that you're you might look at a compass, but you're not going to be reading those kind of dense instructions. So it's the another one of the ironies of Barclay. You need to have been there before you can understand mm. the instructions. What was your general uh, food of choice going round, both of you? The first two loops were good, and I actually even ate all my food, I think, on loop two. And Damien gave me a, a Kit Kat, um, which I was very grateful for sometime. I think it was on loop, at the end of loop two. Um, so, like, I had a mixture of... You know, I had pizza, I had some frittata, which I'd made, which actually worked pretty well earlier on because I could, it was fairly easy to eat. 
um I had some yeah pizza frittata I had cheese and marmite um cheese and pickle sandwiches I had uh and then flapjack homemade flapjack I had like snickers bars some sweets and kind of saved gels for when I needed them I think those were and some trail mix and um, those sorts of things um I'd just say that like as time went on I, I struggled more to eat things what really works for me is bananas when I come into the camp that's like the one thing that works really well for me and I don't even like bananas that much and most of the time I mean they're okay but I'm not like one of those people that has a banana every day not by any means but on races that's the one thing that like it's perfect just always always hits the spot um so um and in camp I kind of had things like had some rice pudding porridge pasta um yeah those sorts of things um but I struggled in the later loops to eat and that was definitely one of the challenges for me actually Jasmine I was curious to ask uh did you eat some of the pasta that I made because I heard a, a podcast or something and they were complimenting the look of the pasta you were eating and I was wondering if it was the, the, yeah, the pasta I had knocked together I had your pasta I think early on yeah I think I, I yeah with broccoli, broccoli bits in and stuff yeah it was good Oh, brilliant. It's incredibly rare I get any sort of compliment uh, regarding food preparation or cooking. So I'm, I'm going to take that. I'm going to tell my kids. Um, but thank you for the pickle again. <laughs> this is this is the one You're thing, welcome. the one success he's going to take away from Barclay this year. Come on. You know, going out onto Leap 5, the main thought was, can I get round in the, you know, by 60 hours type thing? And when I first went out, I was like almost stumbling down the track because um, I felt pretty bad. Um, yeah. But it, you know, I ate my banana and then I actually said to myself out loud, come on, you're going to do this. And, you know, I did a bit of kind of a pep talk for myself out loud. It's a nice thing. You're in the forest. You can talk to yourself as much as you like. You can sing, you can shout at yourself. John Kelly does a lot of grunting noises. I joined him for I a bit of one in the night, yeah. Laz said you looked uh, dead on your feet at the end of loop four. You were sat on a chair, you had a little sleep, you threw up big time, as far as I understand it, um, <laughs> and then you headed out onto loop five. John Kelly uh, passed you halfway round and he was doing maths in his head and he said, there's no way she can do this. Then he heard that what time you got to the tower. And again, he said, OK, well, it looks like it's just a matter of how much over the cutoff she's going to be. What the heck got you round in what was, to be perfectly frank, a ridiculously fast last half of that fifth loop? I think, I think it was just adrenaline. You know, it's interesting because... Like people keep telling me these kind of facts about how I guess lots of people were writing me off at the fire tower, but I I really felt like I could do it. I mean, I, that that's what comes home to me is your total self belief. I tweeted when you got to the tower. I tweeted, "This is going to be unbelievably tight," and then I did actually tweet, "Times up at about one minute to." the hour and and then Keith tweeted that you'd fin and I went absolutely mental it is hard to put into words and I don't really know why it is because you know your spine uh, race was unbelievable but for some reason this finish above all the others and you know john kelly said it's the it's it's possibly the best sporting event he'll witness and i think you said damien in in the flesh you know ever and for me sitting at home looking at twitter it was it was the best thing i've ever seen it truly was i was absolutely blown away it's an incredible thing looking back on it and now it's like now you could think he couldn't have written a better story, but at the time it was very stressful. D uh, Damien, um, how how gutted were you, and then how elated were you? At how, you know, what were those two extremes of emotion like for you? Yeah, I felt I felt I suppose very deflated, and you're really tired as well, so it adds to it. And yeah, I felt deflated, and then I just kind of thought, well, what you know, what can you make? What's the best you can make from this situation? I suppose, and it was to. Although Laz, you know, I was a bit torn because Laz does want you to come in. If you if you know you can't finish, he wants you to come in. Um, uh, that is what I did the previous year. And I did think, I remembered some words from Gary Robbins from previous years of, of like, this is your one chance to recce the, recce the course because you, you can't get on most of it another, any other day. 
so I did, yeah, I did carry on and, and get to know some of the bits uh, a bit more, but then got sleeping, had a snooze. Um, and then, yeah, it was running in. But then, you know, not far from the gate, I started getting more anxieties about sort of, well, oh, is everyone else finished and they're waiting for me? Will Laz be angry? Um, and then I had this really moving moment of my own, really, when I was approaching the gate. And because you're tired and you can't, well, this is probably my problem, that when I'm tired, I can't <laughs> work things out very clearly. I thought they thought I was finishing, like I had the pages. Of course, I was coming from the wrong direction for starters, and no one had seen me at the fire tower, so they all knew that I hadn't done it. But I, I almost wanted them to stop cheering because they were giving me a wonderful reception, and I actually went like this to, to make it clear that I haven't done it. I don't deserve um, these applause, but they, you know, they carried on anyway, and that was, um, yeah, that was really, really touching actually. And then, and then it was probably a bit under an hour. Um, yeah, my first thing was, where, where's Jasmine? Has she finished? And then, and then I think there's maybe 20 minutes, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, five minutes. And, and yeah, people were having the conversation, but it's still a great achievement. You know, I'm still hopeful. I, I was still hopeful. I, I hadn't sort of, but, but yeah, most people doing the maths. Um, and then we had this mini drama where John Kelly's young son, oldest son was wearing red like Jasmine. And he's just down the bottom. You can see to like a corner and he comes around the corner and someone shouted runner, which means obviously runner coming yeah. in so we all go ah! oh oh it's not there isn't it's not jasmine but he carries on sort of waving his arms and, and and he's running across the road and we can't tell is he just playing does he know what's going on is he trying to tell us something and then and then yeah and then jasmine comes around the corner with um i think about three minutes and yeah i ran down i was i was trying to give you a time update of like exactly how much time you had but yeah you were only <laughs> you were only looking at one thing and that thing was yellow um and but I could see there were two minutes then, and I thought that's probably a minute, minute and a bit. Like that, that I think we're okay. But it was yeah, it was just magical. You were you were kind of hyperventilating, or or yeah, you're in a massive oxygen no. deficit. There aren't any medics there. No. Um, but there was an element of well, for me at least, was oh, is she is she going to be okay? okay? And then yes, yeah, someone someone said we need a can of coke or something, and three people dashed off, and a can of coke arrived. To, um, um, and you seemed. You know, it wasn't long before you were yeah, sitting yeah. up and, and, and yeah, but it was, yeah, yeah, just, just amazing to witness. Um, the kind of overriding feeling when I finished was just, I need to breathe, you know, like that desperate, just desperate need to breathe. Like I, like my body, I guess, was signaling to me, like from the, even from the storybook trail that I needed to slow down. And I was like, I'm not listening to you type thing. And then just, um, if anything, I asked it to go faster as I was trying to run up that hill. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess every all the signals were screaming to me, you need to stop because I can't do this anymore. What do you feel about um, going back? Is it how much of your um, environmental consciousness is weighing heavy on a, a desire to finish this race? Yeah, I mean, I was hoping that would be sort of an added motivational element to, you know, sort of focus me at the, in the moments of... of of you know this means it's it's um yeah financial cost and, and environmental cost and all but also you know to some people a reputational cost as well of of um or, or at least because of my connection to the green runners um um so I was hoping that would make spur me on to you know get it done this year so you're not flying next year um uh, I mean similar to Jasmine I yeah I've pledged to you know only fly once a year maximum I can't think at the moment I have to be careful how I phrase this I can't think of anything else that I would fly for. You know, I've started a petition. <laughs> I have seen that. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I feel I feel like I'm getting far too much attention for the for the <laughs> for everything, far too much praise. Um, but yeah, I saw that. Um, um, yeah, I was very touched <laughs> by all the people uh, who signed. Well, it. listen, you know, I, I I'm I'm not. It's not necessarily <laughs> about giving you you know a glitzy night out at an awards ceremony. But I, you know, um, hopefully it's again it's it's spreading. To, to some people who may not be aware of of what you've achieved um the the message that you know if you challenge yourself you can do these things and i know that you know um we haven't really spoken about it today but empowering women to get out there stand on the start line of of ultra races and and, and do things that they perhaps were afraid of doing perhaps didn't think that they were worthy of of participating in and getting out there and, and achieving stuff they didn't think they could. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, that's that's what I hope that that I'm able to spread that message now. Yeah, so that's the 
that's a, that's a wonderful thing i think yeah but but if you do win sports personality of the year um you know i want to thank you <laughs> <laughs> he wants to be the plus one <laughs> no de- no you can be the plus one damien you can be the plus one i don't want to go have you got a tux <laughs> no these are my best clothes <laughs> Thanks, Jasmine. Thanks, Damien. See you. Take care. care. Bye-bye.